Great, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, I am super, super excited to give this talk. I feel like for the past year and a half, I've been doing the conference circuit and singing the praises of Service Mesh. And uh, now we come here and there's like 20 talks on Service Mesh. So I don't feel like I have to do that talk anymore, which is great. Uh, so what we're gonna do today is I'm gonna go into some of the kind of uh, deep dive system internals of Envoy. Um, so I apologize in advance if you don't know what Envoy is, this is probably not the talk talk for you. <laughs> um, and computer is frozen. Let me see here. Oh, there it goes. Okay, cool. Um, so just a real quick agenda. Um, I'm going to go over kind of the overall goals of Envoy and kind of why we actually started the project. Um, we'll do a high-level arch overview, uh, and then we're going to dig deep into the threading model. Uh, we'll talk about the hot restart capability, uh, which is the capability to uh, restart Envoy full binary reload without dropping any connections. Uh, we're going to talk about stats, which is pretty interesting, uh, and then I'll leave plenty of time for doing Q&A. Um, so just from the 30-second version, in case any of you hopped in here and you actually don't know what Envoy is, uh, the Envoy project goal uh, is that the network should be transparent to applications. So you know, from a microservice developer perspective, we're living in this world right now where uh, lots of people are doing microservices, uh, but unfortunately, they're still spending too much time not focusing on their actual business logic. Uh, they're debugging network issues, they're debugging infrastructure issues, uh, and it's a very confusing situation. So we would like to uh, you know, make an abstract network for people so that they can write their applications and they can focus on their business logic. So when we were initially um, you know, doing the, the Envoy project plan, um, this was back in 2015, uh, and you know, we were looking around, obviously I was working at Lyft at the time, and uh, Lyft you know, had started their microservice rollout, and uh, you know, that was not going very well. At the beginning of 2015, Lyft, I think, had a monolith. Uh, you know, it had like 30 uh, different services written in Python. And at that time, uh, because of all of the typical problems in the microservices world, uh, you know, the microservice rollout was basically aborted. People were just having too much problems actually figuring out what was going on. So from an Envoy design goal perspective, uh, first thing is we weren't going to do an actual library. We're going to do an out-of-process proxy. Uh, that's because Lyft, even at that time, already had multiple languages. Uh, we had PHP. We had Python. I think there was like a single Java service at that time. Uh, we were thinking about you know doing Go. Um, you know, so we knew that we didn't want to maintain a library for all of these languages. Um, we knew that, you know, from a long-term perspective, particularly when we wanted to open source Envoy, I, I knew at the time that we would be competing in horse race benchmarks against like HAProxy, Nginx. Um, so, you know, we wanted to focus on doing a solution, you know, that was low latency, high perf. Um, also wanted to try for developer productivity. Uh, so at the beginning of 2015, that led us to choosing C++. If I were to choose today, it's not completely clear that we would still use C++, but at the time, that was a pretty clear decision. Um, Envoy, at its core, is an L3, L4 filter architecture, and that means that, at its core, it's a byte proxy. Um, and that allows it to be used for multiple protocols, which is pretty key. So, for example, for today, we use Envoy for Redis, we use it for HTTP, um, we do it for MongoDB, uh, we're probably going to do Kafka. So, you know, from a low-level perspective, we want to have a core that has a bunch of functionality, but can actually be extended to do multiple protocols. Um, obviously, a huge amount of the internet is HTTP, um, so we wanted a, a separate filter stack at that level so that people could write very interesting plug-in functionality uh, up there. Um, we knew at the time, back in 2015, that H2 was the future, and at that time, actually, really no proxy supported you know, full H2 proxying from an end-to-end -end perspective. Um, still today, I think Nginx only got that functionality in about the last month. So it's taken a couple of years, actually, for most proxies to kind of catch up to this H2 first perspective. Um, we'll talk about it more, but one of Envoy's kind of core tenets is obviously service config discovery. We spend a huge amount of time um, on an ability to have an API to actually drive Envoy config. And that's mostly from operational experience, seeing what it's like to actually deploy proxy and deploy configurations, and then have to go through and deal with the operational mess of hopping things and like making sure the files get there and then files get corrupted. It's a, it's a pretty crappy situation. Um, 
Um, obviously, we wanted to do uh, you know, a whole bunch of active and passive health checking. Um, advanced load balancing was really the core. So obviously, load balancing, rate limiting, circuit breaking, timeouts, et cetera. Um, and you know, I, I talk about it in most of my talks, not this deep dive talk, but really, I, I would say the biggest goal of Envoy is actually observability. And you know, what you'll find in these kind of polyglot microservice architectures is that understanding and debugging what is going on is an incredibly difficult problem. So uh, you know, having best in class like stats, logging, tracing, you know, these are things that that really make it so that you can you can kind of understand the problems that are occurring. Um, other thing was, you know, what you'll find historically is that people would do things like deploy Nginx at the edge, but they would deploy HA proxy, you know, for their internal service-to-service -service traffic. And what you'll find is that 90% of what these proxies do are the same, maybe even 95 or 99%. They're all doing service discovery. They're all doing load balancing. You know, there's very few logic at the edge that is different from what is done internally. So from an operational agility perspective, it was very important that we actually use the same code. It's just a lot easier to operate the same code that you're running uh, from your service proxy to your middle proxy to your edge proxy. Um, and hot restart was a was a core goal. Uh, again, hot restart is the ability to actually restart uh, Envoy without dropping any connections. Uh, and we'll talk about that more. Um, so here is a, a very high-level architecture diagram of, of Envoy, and you know, unfortunately, this is a short talk, so I'd love to talk really at length about filters, but I just don't, don't have time. Um, but just from a very high-level perspective, what you'll see here is that uh, Envoy, you know, kind of has a connection processing pipeline, and obviously here I'm only showing kind of uh, you know normal REST-type traffic, um, but you can kind of extend that to what it would look like for Redis or MongoDB or something something else. Um, but what you'll see is that you know, connections come in before connections are processed. We have a couple of different types of filters within Envoy. So filters are extension points that people can write to actually modify functionality beyond the core. So we have listener filters. These are filters that operate before we make the actual connections. Um, and then once the connection is established, then we have TCP or L3, L4 filters. So this is where you would do your Redis or your MongoDB or your HTTP. Um, and then these create a chain of filters. So if you've used uh, libraries like Netty or, or other similar libraries that allow you to compose different chains of filters, um, it, it's a pretty powerful programming paradigm because you can do things like have an auth filter followed by a rate limit filter followed by a protocol sniffing filter, and you can compose these filters in different ways that are, that are quite interesting. Um, and then, you know, at that layer, um, from an HTTP processing perspective, we actually have an HTTP connection manager filter, which is an L3, L4 filter that actually, you know, parses out the bytes and makes messages, so things like headers, body, trailers. Um, and then once you're up at that layer, then we have a separate set of filters that operate on those headers, body, trailers, and at the HTTP layer can do things like, again, do auth or rate limiting or buffering, but instead of operating at the byte level, we're now operating at the HTTP message level. So from a, uh, from a filter writer perspective, it's a lot more natural and a lot easier to actually plug in functionality there. Um, once you get kind of from the front end of the proxy and you're about to you know, do, do your routing, which is what most people are using Envoy for, we actually have a filter, which is the router filter. So that's your service router. Um, and then there's a whole separate portion of Envoy, which is kind of this backend engine, which does all of the upstream or backend or endpoint management. And that's what we call the cluster manager. So the cluster manager is uh, the thing that basically knows about all of the sets of backends that Envoy can eventually route to. Um, and uh, so a cluster is basically a grouping of hosts. So that would be your, for example, your location service or your user service or Lyft, your pricing service. Um, and then a cluster is composed of multiple backends. So these are hosts. Uh, so it's cluster manager to cluster to hosts. So what you'll see from this diagram is that we have this connection processing pipeline. And then there's a bunch of central functionality that is common to that entire pipeline. So that's stats, that's admin, so we allow people to kind of dump rich information from the box because it's very useful from a debugging perspective. Um, we have parallel managers, uh, so we have a cluster manager, we have a listener manager. These are the listeners that uh, you know, accept incoming traffic and set up all of these filter stacks. Uh, and then we have routes also. 
Um, and then at its core too, we have, again, I don't have time to talk about it, but we have a concept of the XDS, or this is our discovery service API. So these are things like uh, listener discovery service, cluster discovery service, endpoint discovery service. Um, and this information gets fed into all of these managers, uh, and then that's how Envoy knows about all of the backend information. So let, let's step back, and before we kind of dive into what the threading model looks like, um, you know, we'll kind of talk about historical trends in this area. And from a proxy perspective, if you go back 15 or 20 years, uh, you know, the way that it was common to uh, you know, write networking software is you would have an operating system thread, and then you have a connection per, per thread, and that's just how things were basically uh, written back then. And um, in the last, at this point, probably 15 years, uh, there's been a trend towards kind of what people loosely call C10K. There was some paper written in the early 2000s that kind of popularized this term. And that's basically running 10,000 connections per box, which now today, 10,000 uh, connections per box is kind of a joke. But at that time, you know, that was like big, big numbers. Um, and what is important to understand, which still holds true today, is that you really can't do connection per thread. It just doesn't work. Like, you know, not to get too deep into operating systems, but threads have stack, there's context switching. Um, so if you're trying to, on a box, you know, have 10,000, 20,000, 500,000 connections, and you're doing a connection per thread, you just can't do it. Like, there's just not enough memory. You're going to waste a lot of time context switching from a CPU perspective. So in the early 2000s, the connection per thread uh, kind of paradigm fell out of favor. Um, the unfortunate part of that is that connection per thread is very easy to program uh, because everything is effectively synchronous and blocking. Uh, so you let the operating system essentially schedule everything for you. Uh, and, and that is, from a reasoning perspective, that is quite simple. Uh, in the early 2000s, really started by Nginx, uh, we moved towards a, uh, a multiple connections per thread model. And what that uses is an, is an async event loop. Um, and essentially now, all of your logic has to be async. Uh, and unlike synchronous programming, which is very easy, most programmers can kind of understand what's going on, you block, you get some type of error. Asynchronous programming is very complicated. Um, things happen out of order, you have to handle all these cases that can happen, and uh, it, it's quite complicated. But in order to scale, uh, you know, uh, individual machines to high connection counts and high throughput, this is basically the only way to do it. Um, there are other methods now that people are exploring around things like coroutines and things like that, which are super interesting, and I, I'd love to talk about that too, but not, not enough time. But historically, in the last, again, 10 to 15 years, we're now moving towards this highly async model. So that takes us to Envoy itself and, and the way the core of Envoy actually works. And what we do in Envoy is, um, unlike Nginx, um, Envoy is a single process. So there is not like a, you know, multiple processes on, on the box. Um, we do a single process and we use uh, different, different threads within that process. Um, the reason that's done is mainly because uh, coordinating complex tasks between threads is a lot simpler than doing it between processes. Uh, and it's just uh, from an operational perspective, it's easier to manage one process than having to manage an array of processes with, with a different process manager. Um, but one of the things that we do in Envoy is that there's a concept of a, a main thread. So this is kind of like your boot thread. And the main thread hosts uh, low throughput but highly important behavior. So these are things like XDS fetches, so going out to all of the discovery services. Or we have a concept called runtime, which is like loading feature flags from disk, or doing stat flushes, uh, or admin server, or just general process management, like listening for, for like signals and stuff like that. Um, so these are things that don't take much CPU, you know, so they're not very CPU intensive, but we do them on one thread. And one of the benefits of this is that none of this requires locking. Like it's effectively, it's, it's a lot simpler to reason about where even though it's asynchronous, it's not like there's any kind of thread pool or connection pool. And you'll see that as a theme in Envoy. There are no, there are no thread pools in, in Envoy at all. Um, and, and the reason for that is that asynchronous programming is hard enough. But when you couple thread pools and all the locking that come with thread pools with asynchronous programming, it gets very, very complicated. So we have this split where we have a main thread, which does a bunch of this low rate kind of important functionality. And then what we do is, uh, based on the, the 
concurrency parameter, we boot uh, n worker threads. And uh, by default, we run one worker thread per hardware thread on, on your machine. So if you have four hardware cores, we will boot four, four workers. Um, and workers are the actual data plane. So the workers host the listeners, they run accept, they accept connections, and that, that entire kind of chart that I showed you before about going through that entire filter pipeline, that all only happens on the workers. Um, and what, what, uh, what this does, and the reason that this is important, is that this is what we call an embarrassingly parallel architecture. Uh, there needs to be no coordination between the workers, and basically what that means is that there is no locking. Uh, that's a slight lie. There's locking in certain cases, but not in any high throughput cases. Um, so this allows Envoy to scale to a massive number of cores. And you know, for a proxy that was originally written, say, in the late 90s or in the early 2000s, um, you know, it's not that high. Uh, High, high core processing was uncommon, but it wasn't super common. Whereas today, you know, most of the big cloud vendors, they're running boxes that have 90, 90 plus cores. Um, so, and they run servers like Envoy that run on all 90 cores. So um, at that core count, you actually really have to start thinking about what the actual locking looks like. Um, so since we were writing this in 2015, and it was pretty clear that you know, this is the way the architectures are going, uh, we opted for this embarrassingly powerful uh, parallel architecture. One thing that I will point out is that, which is kind of interesting, and I don't have too much time to actually go into, but um, there are certain things, particularly on Linux, that make this difficult, right? Because the way, the way that this works is that if you're only going to run you know, one thread per hardware core, it, it can't ever block. If it blocks, you're, you're basically fucked. Um, and so there are operations, uh, particularly in Linux, where even though they're technically non-blocking, they, they actually block. Uh, and one of those things is file I.O. Uh, and you'll particularly get into situations in virtualized environments where when you tell the kernel, for example, to do a you know, cache write or something like that, we, we see this at Lyft all the time, or like the way that the Amazon EBS driver is written, like it'll go through and it'll end up blocking, and then like you're blocked, right? So that's obviously bad. Um, so there are certain cases where because of this, we have to push functionality off to other threads. So for fire flushing, what we actually have to do is, you know, we'll have to basically put data onto a file flush thread so that it never blocks those data processing threads. Um, but again, this architecture is designed to be massively parallel. Um, so the, the next core concept before I kind of get into how this is used is, uh, is a locking paradigm called RCU. So this stands for read, copy, update. And, and um, you know, this might be common to you or it might not be. It's, it's a pretty interesting thing. Um, it's used heavily within the Linux kernel. Uh, it's a synchronization paradigm which was designed for uh, very high core counts and it's designed for read heavy, write infrequent workloads. And what this paradigm allows you to do is it allows you in the read in the read path to take no locks. So you can actually spread data across many parallel kind of threads and you can read the data without acquiring any, any locks at all. Uh, and it's super interesting. And, and the way that this works, um, which might not be very intuitive, is you have some update process, which I, which I show here, um, and then say the update process makes new data. And from an Envoy perspective, that new data might be uh, new cluster information or like new route information or something like that. Instead of people that need to actually read that data, instead of them acquiring a lock and then say, you know, reading what the current time is or like reading what the hosts are, what ends up happening is that the updater will take that data, which will be reference counted, and then that will get posted over to the event loop that's running on every worker, because remember, every worker is fully async, running its own event loop. So that data gets posted over. And then the key for RCU is that there's this thing called the quiescent period. And basically what that means is that there are people that will use this data and the only time that you can update the data is when uh, the people that are reading the data are quiescent or are, are not running. And from an event loop perspective, this is really any time that an event in that loop is not running. So what we end up doing is that this ref counted data, which in C++ is a shared pointer, basically gets copied to all of the event loops. And then it might be true that at the point that the event loop is actually running, people are holding on to a shared pointer, for example, to a route table or something like that. 
that. But then when the event loop comes back and it processes the message for this new route table, it'll basically copy in that new route table. Any people that held the, the, the old route table will continue to hold it and it'll be ref counted. But any new readers of that route table will get the new route table. Um, and that is all done without locking. So it's a, it's a, it's a pretty cool thing. Um, I would encourage you to go look at the, <clears throat> at the Wikipedia article. Um, how it's used in, in Envoy, I would still call it RC. You, but it's a little different than what the what the kernel does because the kernel has to do it with interrupts and, and a whole bunch of other complicated stuff. But this is a this paradigm, this locking paradigm, is really uh, pervasive in in Envoy. So the next important concept is a TLS or, or thread local storage. And like we talked about, we have this massively parallel architecture. And within this architecture, you know, we typically have to host thread local data. And again, that might be things like load balancer context or, or local host context or um, you know, local cluster manager context. There's all kinds of things that, again, in order to avoid locking, this has to be spread and be embarrassingly parallel across all of the workers. So the way that TLS works in Envoy is it's, it's a little different than what you might be used to. And it's because it has to be worker aware. So in most languages, you know, there's some keyword that you can use you know, to say like, give me like a thread local variable. You know, and that's typically some type of static variable that is thread local. Um, that doesn't really work here because what, what you'll see in a second is that we need the ability to use these thread local slots to actually accept RCU data and then read that later. So with a normal like operating system or language level thread local variable, that doesn't actually give us the context of what we actually need. Um, so what we allow uh, things to do is we allow them to allocate what we call TLS slots. And this is just a vector of pointers. And again, this is like an arbitrary vector. And you can imagine the different pieces of the system actually say, you know, I need a TLS slot to do something. It's abstract. Um, and what you'll see in this picture is we have you know, five different TLS slots, the different things in the system have, have actually, um, you know, basically allocated. And that live on the main thread. And then what you'll have is that on each worker, there's a parallel vector of those five slots. And the way that it works is that we couple TLS and RCU such that when a process on the main thread, let's say they're operating this picture on slot three, and let's say that slot three contains a route table, what will happen is that the updater will basically put the new route table, which is reference counted, in slot three. It'll post to all of the workers and basically say, update the thing that you have in slot three. So you can see this post, right? And then basically on that worker, which is doing all these event loops, when a process needs to use the information, it'll say, give me the current value of slot three, which again might be this route table or cluster information. And this coupled together gives us this, this kind of really strong uh, kind of programming building block where we can update data on the main thread we can send that over to all the workers where it'll be eventually consistent and eventually used, um, but we don't have to acquire any locks, which is, which is pretty awesome. So to put that all together, let's take a look at, at, you know, from a concrete case of how Envoy uses TLS and RCU to actually do cluster updates. So again, to refresh, a, a cluster is a grouping of backends. So it's like the location service at, at Lyft. Um, so as I was saying before, we have a cluster manager, which manages all, all of the clusters. Um, the cluster manager is getting inputs from different things. So we have a health checker, which might be doing active health checking. We have a passive health checker, which is doing outlier detection. Um, depending on our service discovery type, we might be using DNS, we might be using XDS. Um, so all of these signals are basically, are basically coming into the cluster manager. And when the cluster manager detects that a host set has changed, so again, a cluster manager, cluster, set of hosts, let's say that a host becomes unhealthy or, or a host goes away. The cluster manager on the main thread will compute the new set of hosts, the new set of healthy and unhealthy bits. It'll make a new array, which is basically a reference counted kind of uh, share, share pointer of a vector. And then it'll, in its TLS slot, it'll RCU post that to all of the workers, right? So the step, you know, step one is cluster manager, we're getting two is health checker, three is DNS. Then we post this new set over to the event loop on the worker. 
the worker will again update that data in that slot, right, in thread local storage. And then when the next event comes and has to do load balancing or has to make a decision based on that data, it can acquire that information and then host that again without acquiring any, any locks. So this is like embarrassingly parallel and can scale to an almost infinite number of threads. So moving on to hot restart. So hot restart, again, is the ability for Envoy to reload, uh, you know, to do a full reload, including a binary, um, a binary or config reload without closing any connections. And, um, you know, at, at this conference, we obviously spent a lot of time talking about Kubernetes and containers and, like, that's awesome and blue-green deploys. Most companies still have lots of things that don't run in Kubernetes, uh, and, and that includes Lyft. And you know, in the new kind of container world or in the new Kubernetes world, um, it's much more common to do what we call a, a rolling deploy or a blue-green deploy. And that's where you know, if you want to uh, run some new software, you're going to tell Kubernetes to obviously spin up you know, my new containers. You're going to do like a gradual uh, traffic shift between the old containers and the new ones, and you can roll back or roll forward. And then when you're confident in your deploy, you say, kill all those old containers. That's wonderful, and I would love to have that, and that's amazing, but most companies still don't have that. Um, most companies are still stuck in a world where you, know, you have a bunch of software that runs in virtual machines or in bare metal, and you know, the ability, you can't do this blue-green deploy because you don't, you don't have like 100 other computers sitting around to spin up your software and update your load balancers and kind of do, do all of those things. So many companies are still stuck in this world where you, know, you might want to update Envoy, either binary or configs, and if you were to have to do that you know, with having to drain connections, it would take a long time, it would be very disruptive. So the ability to restart without actually dropping any connections makes Envoy deploys in some types of configuration changes like way, way, way simpler. So this is a pretty important feature still for many different people. Um, so the, the way that hot restart works is, uh, which is which is a little different kind of than the way that most systems do this, is um, we, we basically allow two different processes of Envoy to run at the same time. And um, there's a shared memory region, which mostly contains stats, and I'm going to talk about stats next. But from an operational perspective, obviously from stats, you know, we have counters, we have gauges, and we also have histograms. Um, Particularly for gauges, it is incredibly useful for the gauges to be consistent across hot restart. And the reason that that's useful is let's say that you have a gauge for the number of active connections. If the gauge is only tracked in the new process, when you hot restart Envoy, if you were to have, say, a 15 minute drain time or an hour drain time, your gauge will immediately go to zero, even though your box still potentially has 100,000 connections. So from a monitoring perspective, that's, that's quite confusing. So being able to share gauges and have consistent counters uh, you know, across these two processes, it makes operations much easier. So we, we have this shared memory region where we allocate a bunch of backing memory for stats, and I'll get into stats more, more next. Um, and then we have a couple of locks that we use, again, not at the high throughput kind of data, data path mechanism, um, but, you know, for example, if we have to allocate a stat in the shared memory region, we have to use a lock also in shared memory. Or for a certain type of access logging, we're going to have to acquire a shared memory lock. Um, or there's a you know, few other things that kind of live in the shared memory region. And then um, the way that it works is that when the new process starts up, we have a very lightweight RPC protocol uh, that runs over Unix domain sockets where the two envoys will basically talk to each other. And they'll ask each other things like, what version are you? Like, are we compatible? And then they'll actually do socket passing. So we'll pass uh, sockets between the envoys. Um, uh, and we do that still. So in, in for the past four or five years, um, there's a way in Linux where you can basically open a, a socket, you know, kind of multiple times um, so that you have to do this socket passing dance. But as it turns out, uh, that code still drops connections in certain cases. So if you want, like, fully dropless connection handling, you still have to do this dance of passing sockets over, over this kind of, over this low-level connection. 
Um, so what we do here, again, is we have the shared memory region. Uh, the Envoy will boot up. It'll you know, allocate stats. It'll attach to the existing shared memory region. Um, you know, and then maybe it, it'll go through and kind of uh, pass some sockets around. Um, and then you know, the new Envoy will basically tell the old one, OK, like, I'm, I'm good. I'm accepting traffic. Please go start draining. And then based on a configuration of you know, what will actually happen there, um, you know, there'll be some amount of drain time. So 15 minutes, hour, two hours, depending on what actually happens. Um, and then eventually the old envoy will shut down. Um, and this allows kind of this communication to happen without any, any single process wrapper. And that's actually key. Uh, the way that this historically has been done is that typically a process will come up and it'll kind of uh, build what we call like a little trampoline. And then that will keep forking and execing itself. Um, that does not work in containers uh, because obviously the way the containers work is you have a process. When the process dies, the container goes away. So if we want hot restart to work in a container world, and even in containers, there are people that want to use hot restart for various reasons. Um, because the only communication is over Unix domain sockets and shared memory, if you give your containers the capability to access shared memory and Unix domain sockets, this process will work over over normal containers, which is pretty powerful. Um, so this is the first time that, that I know of that we've done something like this, where it's kind of built for container container ready. Okay, um, just check my time. Great. Um, so from a from a uh, stats perspective, we have a couple of different things here, uh, and, and I think stats are interesting because they're obviously done at very high throughput. Um, so from a stats perspective, we have what we call a store. So this is kind of a holder of data, so counters, gauges, and histograms. Um, we have a sync. So these are a protocol adapter. So Envoy was built from the get-go to support multiple stats backends. So it doesn't only work with Prometheus. Like it'll work with stats D. We actually now have a gRPC metric service where we can push stats. Um, we have an admin server that can pull stats from. So we have a stats endpoint. So Envoy can work in both a push mode and a pull mode. So if you're using stats D, you're going to push. If you're using Prometheus, you're going to pull. Um, and then one of the really interesting things that we have is a concept of a scope. So a scope is a grouping of stats that together um, can basically be deleted. And this, this, you wouldn't think that it's important, but it ends up being incredibly important because when you're using shared memory and you have an Envoy architecture um, where you can live reload clusters and listeners, if you don't allow stats to be block deleted, you will leak a ton of memory, right? Because over time, you're going to update clusters, you're going to delete clusters, you're going to update listeners, you're going to delete listeners. Um, so you need grouping of stats that you can basically delete together. So um, the, the way that stats work, which is very interesting, and again, is has been heavily tuned for performance, mainly because Envoy has a lot of stats and, and uh, alters stats quite a bit, is um, we, we have, again, using some of the concepts that we've talked about between RCU and TLS, um, we have a mechanism where we have a kind of a global store for stats. Stores contain scopes. And then depending on the type of data, we either allocate it from shared memory or from process memory. So uh, counters and gauges are uh, allocated from shared memory. Histograms are allocated from process memory. The reason for this uh, mainly is that histograms are a lot more complicated than uh, counters and gauges. And there is not as much operational benefit of having them in shared memory and consistent between restarts. Like It doesn't matter that much if you have timing data that you lose from the old process. Um, and the way that this process works to keep it very high performance is that, um, you know, it's all thread local. So basically, if you're a thread or a worker and you're looking for a stat, we'll first actually look in a thread local cache of that stat. And if the stat exists, we just return it immediately without acquiring any locks, and then that stat can be incremented. If the stat does not exist in the cache, it'll go back to the central store. It'll look there. If it's there, it'll add it to the cache and then basically return it. If it's not in the central store, then it'll go into a slow path and it'll allocate it from shared memory or from process memory. It'll store it in the central store and then it'll move it into the TLS cache. And then from then forward, it doesn't actually ever have to be accessed via, via lock. Um, and the one interesting piece here is that 
because we delete scopes, you have to have the ability to flush the cache. So what will end up happening is that when a listener or a cluster gets destroyed on the main thread, um, we'll basically post a message to all of the workers to say, hey, I don't need this cluster anymore. I don't need this listener anymore. Go ahead and delete all of that cache data. Um, and that's how we basically keep things up to date without actually leaking any memory. Lastly, and this is something that just got implemented and actually then got reverted and now is about to get added again, is, uh, is TLS histograms. And I'll, I'll go through this super quick because I think I'm basically out of time. Um, and um, what we do here from this perspective is we have a kind of a parent histogram. We have a TLS histogram that um, you know, lives on every worker. And then from the merge perspective, what we actually do is we allow the ability for the histogram to accept values into a kind of a primary histogram and a backing histogram. So the way that it works is that on the TLS worker, it's flipping back and forth between histogram A and histogram B. Again, requiring no locks. Um, and then during the merge process, what actually happens is we post to all of the workers, we tell it to flip the current histogram um, so that, again, no locking is needed. Then we can go back, and if we're currently writing into histogram A, then we can go and we can merge all of the backing histogram Bs without, without any, any locks. Um, so that is TLS histograms. So uh, in a quick summary, um, from an Envoy perspective, uh, you know, we're biasing for developer productivity. Um, you know, we would like to obviously you know, have high throughput and low latency. We want developers to be productive writing code. Uh, it's an embarrassingly parallel architecture, uh, aiming to scale to very high hardware uh, thread counts. Uh, we use a lot of RCU and TLS. Uh, designed for containerized world, uh, and again, try to have extensibility at every, every different layer. So thank you. Um, my normal plug for Lyft, we are, we are hiring, so feel free to come grab me if you're interested in, in jobs. Um, love growing the Envoy community. Uh, I overran my time, sorry, new talk, um, but I'll be standing here and I can co come and answer questions. And thank you very much.